We live in a dream, a direct manifestation in between truth and untruth, holding both potentials that has turned into nightmare. This was due to a sort of fog that descended and darkened the connection to our source. Such is the density of this fog that it corrupted even nature to consume itself in an endless cycle, or at least so the fog makers wished it to be endless. Yet the fog will lift and the fog has already been lifting the more it envelops the world, as paradoxical as it may sound. This fog is immoral in essence. It lurks in direct opposition to truth, vying to be the tool that keeps the living trapped forever. The shadows who cast this fog, little by little, not only into the hearts and minds of men, but also into the world's very nature, are the rejected thoughts of a morally oriented mind. Yet the more they were rejected, the more they grew in hatred and strength such as repressed shadow does in a mankind's psyche. To see in these shadows the potentials of our own thoughts causes great shame when we ourselves are aligned with seeking truth. We do not accept that such things potentially exist within that deviates from our better self-image. And it is exactly because we are vague distorted reflections of this pure truth of origin, that we are the main target of the fog-making shadows. Their purpose is to make ourselves so deplorable in our own soul's eyes by tempting us into becoming their fog-making tool and fall into welcoming sin or immorality as virtues. That we become unworthy thought characters and even reject our own selves and any kind of connection to that truth source. If the shadows succeed in bringing us to their level, in enslaving us with promises of liberation, or in making us robotic with promises of equality, they will then not only have a food source, the metaphorical tumors addressed in the respective contemplation, but also more like them to mitigate their extreme lonely nature. Misery loves company, or the wretched find comfort in fellow sufferers, as in Dr. Faustus. And tell me, what good will my soul do thy lord? Enlarge his kingdom? Is that the reason why he tempts us thus? Wretches find comfort in fellow sufferers? In an attempt to avoid altogether the shame of confronting themselves with the abhorrent thoughts, impulses, and immoral temptations that are reflected onto their soul's mirror, some willingly seek refuge in the pride that protects them from that shame and submerge completely in the shadows or demons so as to not have to feel it. This is addressed in the contemplation Shame and Pride. They willingly became the wretched, otherwise originally abhorrent to them, and will spend the rest of their time in the story of this world, trying to gather, by temptation and manipulation, more and more company into their state, as their fleeting comfort of not being left alone to suffer rejection. This story of this world reference is addressed more deeply also, in the contemplations, metaphors of books, and shadow play. Do re-listen. Those of us who are morally aligned to truth, we all have thoughts and impulses that are rejected, potential abominable characters that we could become or manifest just by making a few gradual immoral decisions and concessions to such temptations. Therefore, because we are in His image, so do we feel ashamed of such immorality and iniquity. And the rejected potentials are the fog-making shadows, or demons, that populate the unseen mist of this world, as it is a middle place 
a middle earth. Again, moral choices. Some of us become weaker when tempted by evil. Some of us become stronger. Yet this is not a completely irreversible process. Soul miracles do happen, and people who served evil up to the last moment may suddenly see and realize and realign. The important aspect of the moral choice is not exactly in what we do, but in what we are. I have, assuredly, been at error and even downright failed during the course of my life and the course of the notes I have been presenting to you all through this channel. Sometimes my process may have been an error, sometimes my conclusions. I am a man in the fog, subject to error. But that is not the point, for we cannot see truth directly. It is not the absence of error that determines the alignment, but where you put your soul's heart. The point is that my heart of hearts has, as a compass, been pointing towards truth. And then my mind and my intuition and my very soul has been trying to chart that path in that direction, stumbling here and there in the fog, but always honest and authentic about it. And that compass I mention is moral in essence. It has been, if you like, and using the title of this contemplation as a reference, a personal chosen exorcism that I share, so that you may choose, if you so choose, to go through yours. Despite this confusing fog over the world, there are interventions that pierce it and dissipate it, Events that are a world exorcism, so to speak, when the manifestation of purity ultimately dissipates the rejected immoral thoughts and personages altogether, including the shadows, and purifies the worthy thoughts into an amazing grace, reducing the dream world as these thoughts and potentials go back to truth and less fog fuel is available. Then the process restarts. This is also addressed in the metaphors of Alembic contemplation. I will repeat again something that has to be repeated. Despite all the rabbit holes and the confusion, mine included, for I am also but a man and your fellow classmate, as I've said, the solution to the world's puzzle is a moral one. These world exercising interventions are performed by the saving truth as it manifests into the dream reality. Like in the alembic metaphor, the period of time in which the potential characters are subjected to the temptations and harassment of the shadows and demons is not only fermenting and preparing our middle mash, so to speak, for our spiritual moral resolution, but also making a distinction between those characters that are compatible and those who are incompatible with that cleansing and return to purity of true thought, so to speak. To be in the world but not of the world is the main motto of this transcending power that comes to the rescue. As the essential step that transmutes the seemingly irredeemable mash that stands in between purity and impurity, back into its original state, which is not worldly equality, and it is certainly not worldly liberty either. These are the traps of intelligent shadows and demons that, by using words, remember that truth never speaks them, try to convince the pure-hearted to be equal only inasmuch as any sort of true moral regulation is rejected altogether, so to them to be equal is to all be among a selection of states of sin, and therefore always slaves to them, and as being such slaves, they are only to be liberated 
in so far as the permission to be and go against that true morality goes. In summary, their view is that man should, equally, all submerge in sin and all be liberated from shame to practice and embody sin without attrition or checks. This is, they try to convince us, their idea of natural law. Maybe it was the natural law they were used to before us. It is a deep fallacy, however. True freedom comes from the choice of rediscovering and standing in one's place in truth, observing for and recognizing the signs of that true moral code that we all have buried more or less deeply within the fog we are inserted in. Freedom is not liberty, as it does not come from a release from observing such true morality we innately can discern when centered, but, quite contrarily, it is when we embrace it as our true, original, sinless state, so to speak. In other words, as was written in what regards to your true innermost moral distinctions, be like children. Through being faced with shadow work, those who so morally choose are prepared to realize that they are being returned to the freedom of being of service not the enslavement of thinking themselves kings and, as the world is eventually exercised, as the alembic distills the pure spirit back to truth, they are then made free. We are individual manifestations of pure thought tainted by our deviation from essence. Using the same distillation metaphor, we are the pure spirit that manifested in a middle place and deviated and so turned into potato starch. Facing the insanity that inevitably always takes over the world is how we are returned to that pure state of spirit. Not liberated to be potato starch enslaved with Botox deformities, slurpy lollipops and neon lights by a false stepfather, the prefect, but free to be the purest spirit again, back in the state where our true father awaits to receive us back home, the perfect. Which one will you be with? Have you chosen?